it's been a hard road. But as prophecy say, nothing good come easy. They used to be a question when they asked me, I said, man, what do you mean by Jai heavy load? What do you mean Jai load heavy load? And I said, well, my brethren, the only time are my sister. In, the only time that can be fulfilled take time. I realized after 20 years or 15 years after them say, I said, man, Rastafari, I said, last year, why? It's a heavy load. So I give thanks. So that's my philosophy in my music. Hello, everybody. You're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. The 1970s is generally regarded as the golden age of reggae music. It was the decade when the evolution from rock steady to ska down to reggae music became complete and reggae crystallized into a full skanky heavy sound that literally swept the world with many icons leading the charge in the likes of the Wailers, Burning Spear, Toots and the Metals, Jimmy Cliff and hundreds of others. The level and scale of talent from the golden age was simply ridiculous with extremely talented singers and songwriters, many of whom have attained legendary status since then. Not on the same popularity levels as the Wailers or Burning Spears, but just as endowed with quality. One of such marvelous quality is the phenomenal and legendary Ijaman Levi. This Kingston native came from the same musical DNA as the Wailers and was a childhood friend of Bob Marley. He was on the upward trajectory and was headed for a breakthrough along with his peers when a sudden move abroad and a prison sentence changed his life forever. While most of reggae told the militant path, Ijaman Levi's experiences led him down a route of deep spirituality, scripture and peace. He still attained legendary status but strictly on his own terms. Let's take a look at the excellent Ijaman Levi. Ijaman Levi was born in Christiana, Manchester, Jamaica as Trevor Sutherland in 1946. He grew up in Trenchtown the main hub of musical creativity in Jamaica, which was brimming with ghetto youths who all had big dreams of success in the 1960s. He became drawn to popular trench town singer Joe Higgs and became one of his protégés alongside Bob Marley, Bonnie Whaler and Peter Tosh. He lived on the next street from Bob and Bonnie, who lived on 2nd Street while Ijan Man lived on 3rd Street. By 1963, all the kids being coached by Joe Higgs in Trenchtown began to hustle for talent contests and auditions for the biggest producers in Jamaica. The Whalers had auditioned for Coxon Dodd and had just gotten signed, while young Trevor had heard about a British Jamaican called Chris Blackwell who was conducting auditions for a new label called Island Records and attended an audition organized by the new label. He didn't impress Blackwell and Blackwell told him politely to go back and practice and try again in the future. The young man admitted that he felt disappointed but appreciated Blackwell's respectful feedback and went away with a firm resolve to succeed and impress Chris Blackwell one day. But not long after the failed audition, his parents who lived and worked in England sent for him and he moved to the UK before the end of the year. When he moved to England, he formed a group called The Vibrations with a friend and they spent years together honing their craft and building themselves up for the next opportunity to get a record deal. But before they could make any real headway, his bandmate moved to America. Now on his own, he adopted the stage name U and began to pursue a solo career in 1966. He started attracting interest from various record labels and recorded singles for Polydor Records and Decca Records by 1968. His voice had a quality that was highly sought after. A sweet and gentle style similar to Don Carlos that was quite unique in comparison to the more raspy and edgier styles of his peers in reggae. But just before he could lock down the big deal and take his career to the next level, he was arrested for assault and resisting arrest in 1970 and was subsequently jailed for three years. It was during his time in prison that he underwent a spiritual conversion. He began to study his Bible deeply and began to go by the name Ijaman. He was released in 1974 and became a member of the Rastafarian group called the 12 Tribes of Israel at their London branch. He would follow a spiritually led life from then on and it's been the secret of his success. In January 1975, he had a vision of chapter 21 in the book of Psalms in the Bible and a few days later, he got an invitation from a record label requesting he come and record a song. He took it to be a sign and in line with his vision, he wrote and recorded his eventual classic Ja Heavy Load, which became a massive hit and is now regarded as one of his best songs. He caught the attention again of Chris Blackwell, who at the time he heard the song, didn't know he was the same boy that he had rejected a few years earlier. And after a few meetings, he signed him up on a two-album deal to Island Records. Blackwell immediately paid for the production of an album in Jamaica, and the end result was his awesome debut, Hail I Him, released in 1978. An album that received overwhelming critical acclaim, 
It was a mini album with four tracks of astonishing quality, including Ja Is No Secret and his breakthrough single Ja Heavy Low. His next album, Are We A Warrior, was released in 1979 and also received amazing reviews and smashing critical acclaim. A five track album that included the title song Are We A Warrior and The Church. Despite the great critical successes of his two albums for Island Records, there was the commercial challenge caused by the emerging sound of dancehall. Refusing to water down his sound, he eventually broke ranks with Island Records and in an unexplainable miracle not normally seen in the music business, Ijaman left Island Records with full publishing rights to all of his music. Once again, Ijaman Levi was on his own, an independent artist by 1981. Probably seeing it as the will of Ja for him to be his own man, he opened up his own label, Jamani, and literally went to work like a madman. He released the album Tell It to the Children in 1982 and started a prolific run, releasing 18 albums over 18 years, and worked with the creative talents of the greatest in the industry, like Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare, Earl China, Lloyd Parks, and, and many more. His solo career had recorded a lot of commercial success, exemplified by the song I Do, which was a duet with his second wife, Madge. The song went up to number one on the British reggae charts and cemented his now commercially viable value. Over the years, his popularity has only soared due to the acceptance of his music by loyal and new generations of fans, as well as his consistency in live performances. His last album, Versatile Life, was released in 2006, but he's still actively touring in live concerts as much as he can and is in very high demand all over the world. In the history of reggae, Ajaman Levi will go down as one of the true spiritual leaders of the art form with a strong and wavering spiritual base that will serve as a yardstick for future artists of similar inclinations to follow. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until the next time, Jabless. Now, Brother Bob Marley. It's a relationship we have from boyhood, from Trenchtown. And uh, he wasn't Bob yet, he was just another youth over the fence, like myself. But life changed and one get older and he become world superstar last year. And I'm very happy that when he was alive, I share his company. Because I used to, like I said, used to play my guitar for him in London when he is there and uh, serenade his spirit, myself and lots of Rastaman, 12 tribe, Celestia. And it is wonderful that him though is not here with us now in the flesh, spiritually, he's still with I because that's how come I complete this mission because he visit I.